Well, welcome to the 700 Club. A bombshell has exploded in the Middle East. China's role in brokering an agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran has sent shockwaves throughout the region. Well, it's also fueling fears that America's influence is declining while China's is on the rise. And it's raising concerns about Israel's security and the future of the Abraham Accords. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. After more than a year of meetings and four days of negotiations in Beijing between Iran and Saudi Arabia, China said the three nations reached an agreement. The deal includes resumption of diplomatic relations, reopening their embassies within two months, and a commitment to respect each other's sovereignty, keeping out of their internal affairs. Many Middle East observers are concerned over China's role in brokering the deal. The new and deeply concerning factor here is the Chinese uh, role in all of this. To suddenly find, um, kind of as a surprise, that our new great power competitor, the primary threat to uh, the American-led world order, China, was so central to this deal that involves not only our worst enemy in the Middle East, but bringing them together with one of our oldest Arab friends and allies and partners in the region, Saudi Arabia. Jason Greenblatt, one of the architects of the Abraham Accords, says it reveals China's growing influence and America's waning power in the region and should be a wake-up call to the Biden administration. The United States essentially has ceded some important ground, an important area for U.S. stability and security to China to some degree. That's not good for the United States. I think the United States ought to pay attention. Hanna recently visited Saudi Arabia and met with its top leaders. He says Saudi is hedging its bets because its relationship with the U.S. is not as strong as it once was. If the Saudis had their druthers, the relationship with the United States would be strong, secure. They'd have enormous trust and confidence in it. Unfortunately, that has all eroded drastically over the last two years. That was the message we heard when we were in Riyadh. CBN News asked Greenblatt what this means for Israel. I think Israel needs to take a very, very close watch at this. I think they need to look forward and figure out how do they protect Israel. Despite this deal, Greenblatt remains bullish on the Abraham Accords and believes it's still possible Saudi Arabia could join. And I think we could look to the UAE to understand a country that has recognized a way to be close with Israel, develop strong ties with Israel, do significant business and have security cooperation with Israel, while at the same time being realistic and understanding that Iran is also part of the region and they can have ties with Iran while at the same time as having ties with Israel. With the agreement just days old, many questions still remain about its impact on the region, from the possibility of Saudi Arabia joining the Abraham Accords to the war in Yemen. Gordon? Well, Chris, uh, how does this affect Saudi Arabia joining the Abraham Accords? Is that now dead in the water, or, or do you still see hope here? Uh, no, Gordon, I don't think it's dead in the water, and it doesn't eliminate the prospect that the, the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Israel could have the Saudis joining the Abraham Accords. You know, last Thursday, they actually said what they wanted to join the Accords, and what they want first, and most of all, they want the relationship between themselves and the U.S. Uh, repaired, and they, they actually did that in a Wall Street Journal article last Thursday. And the UAE is an example of a Gulf nation that can actually uh, sort of walk and chew gum. They can develop strong ties with Israel economically and militarily, and yet they still have diplomatic and trade relations with Iran for the last several months. So I think this agreement doesn't necessarily eliminate the Saudis from joining the Abraham Accords. Well, what impact will this have in the Middle East, specifically the war in Yemen? Um, you know, you look at it and it it's kind of seems improbable. Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia was attacked by Iranian drones. Uh, one of their refineries, and, and now they're coming to reestablish diplomatic relations. So it, it, how broad of an impact is this? Well, in terms of the, the war in uh, Yemen, Gordon, it's been going on for years, and it's right now been paused for about a year. Iran has said earlier, actually even today, that this agreement will bring about a political solution uh, and settlement in uh, Yemen. But however, 
That means the world is really going to de be depending on the Iranian Re Revolutionary Guard Corps to keep those commitments. And will Iran cooperate by restraining the Houthis? As you mentioned, uh, you know, they've, they've sent uh, missiles to not only Saudi Arabia, but to the UAE as well. So uh, will Iran be able to restrain their proxy there in Yemen remains to be seen. All right. Well, how's it affecting the internal political climate inside Israel? Uh, it looked like there was hope for Saudi Arabia to normalize relationships with Israel, uh, create a block against Iran. And, and is that is that a problem now for Israel? Well, politically inside uh, uh, Israel right now, Gordon, it's really white hot politically. There have been demonstrations for weeks about the judicial reform. Uh, really one of the most contentious times in Israel's history that I can remember. Uh, when the announcement came out, there was uh, co condemnation by all of Netanyahu's opponents, uh, Yair Lapid, Naftali Bennett, Benny Gantz. On the other hand, there's been no comment by the foreign ministry and no comment by uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. And I, there's a larger question here uh, as well, Gordon. I think, does this preclude I Israel from uh, launching a military strike against Iran's uh, nuclear facilities? I think the answer is no. I think uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Israel uh, really feel that they will not be restrained by any agreement if they feel that the uh, Iranian nuclear program constitute an existential threat to the Jewish state. All right, Chris, well, thank you for your insight. In other news, the Treasury Department is assuring customers of two failed banks that they will have access to their money today. They're also promising that the rescue did not come at the expense of the American taxpayer. Dale Hurd has the story. Banking regulators took action after damage from the second biggest bank failure in U.S. history began to create a panic and rippled around the world. After the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and then Signature Bank of New York, which invested in cryptocurrencies, regulators are now promising depositors they will have access to all their funds when branches open today. I think that without this, there could have been some serious uh, runs on other banks because there would have been a loss of confidence throughout the whole system. The turmoil began last Wednesday when Silicon Valley Bank, a major lender in the troubled tech industry, tried to sell assets to boost its balance sheet after losing money in bond investments when the Fed raised interest rates. That panicked investors as customers raced to withdraw funds after seeing the news on social media. The Fed stepped in, tying up $150 billion in deposits and putting some banks and tech companies at risk. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says the emergency measures put in place are not a bailout because the funds will come from an FDIC account, a pool of money paid into by U.S. banks. We are concerned about depositors and are focused on uh, trying to meet their needs. And while depositors at the banks will be protected, stock and bondholders will not be. The crisis had already spread to Britain, where Silicon Valley Bank had a subsidiary. The government and the Bank of England facilitated the sale of Silicon Valley Bank UK to HSBC for a single pound and ensured the security of deposits. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, on Friday, I told you to pay attention to this California bank, that it was getting to be in trouble. And uh, the problem was that they had all these government bonds. And on their balance sheet, they were having the, the government bonds decline in value because the Federal Reserve had raised interest rates. And so they had to rebalance in order to come into the guidelines from the same federal government that raised the rates. So in, in order to maintain their status, they had to come up with $2 billion in additional capital. They were unable to do that. And literally in the space of hours, I was saying it at 9 a.m. And by noon that day, $40 billion had flowed out of that bank. And here comes the FDIC to shut them down. Uh, that's the precarious nature of our current world economy. This isn't just the U.S. This is happening around the world as banks are coming into trouble because of their balance sheets. And, and it's just sort of natural economics. If the Federal Reserve raises interest rates on bonds, then the value of your existing bonds goes down and you have to then sell them at a loss and get new bonds. And, and it's just a, a sort of a spiral effect. 
if, if the federal government doesn't come in and say we're going to back up every depositor, and then all of us are going to get nervous. But what does that do? Uh, well, it creates worldwide panic. I, I would expect the stock market to be really shaky today until we can come to some kind of stability, find a buyer for this failed bank, and then figure out what to do with all the depositors. But it just shows how one bank can really upset the entire system. You go back to 2008, and it was Lehman Brothers. It was one of the largest in the world. And it affected money markets. And when it did that, our sitting president, President Bush, said, this whole system can come down. We were supposed to be past that. We were supposed to have all these reserves, all these protections in place. And here it is happening again.